Welcome to this place. Please stand with us as we open a word of prayer and open in worship together. Thank you, God, for joining us in this place. Thank you, God, for meeting with us. Lord, bring your spirit down upon us here, and may your spirit move wherever it is that people are watching, people are listening, and people are seeking after you this morning, God. Be with us at this time. In Christ's name. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, gather together, lift up your name, call on our Savior, fall on your grace, hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down. time from where you are please turn and greet one another handshaking is definitely not required but feel free to shout we uh, only have a couple of announcements this morning so you can stay standing it won't be long <laughs> on December the 5th we will be having our Christmas tree lighting ceremony but obviously it's going to look a little bit different this year it's going to be somewhat like our trunk or treat. It's going to be another drive-through event, so just mark that on your calendar, Saturday, December 5th. And also, on your way out, as they were on your way in, we have these cups that are labeled Loonies and Toonies for Missions. So our missions committee is trying to raise a bit more money. They have been a bit low on funds due to our current situations lately. And so you can pick up these cups on your way out, and then over the coming weeks, you can fill them with Loonies or Toonies. You're allowed to stuff a 20 in here if you want. They won't complain. And then you need to bring them back by December 13th. So keep an eye for that on your way up. And at this time, we're going to continue in worship together. Well.
subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and reconcile to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you are on the way to the court, your adversary has settled your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge. You will hand you will hand you over the offering, and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you pay the last penny.
set us free from father but you have set us free from the prisons that we create for ourselves lord now guide our hearts in this time lord in christ's name amen you may be seated over the course of the fall here we've been looking at a sermon series called me and my emojis we're talking about emotions and how we handle them how we deal with them how we see that god wants us to interact with those, and, and how we live our lives with these things called emotions and trying to make sure that we honor God in all of it. And today we come to one that is actually quite difficult. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Anyone here ever get angry? Yeah? Have you seen anybody recently get angry? Uh, like... It seems to me that in today's day and age, and, and, and just with everything that's going on in the year 2020, anger is at, at an all-time high. Like, everywhere you turn, someone's angry. In fact, sometimes you're angry because somebody made a turn in front of you while you're driving. They cut you off. And you just feel this anger come on. You go to a store and you just want to run in and out real quick and you look and you say, oh, because of COVID, we've got this lineup. I've got to stand out in line. I've got to wait. And we get angry. Sometimes you're in the lineup. You're, you're there to pay for your groceries and, and something goes on. Something happens. And you can find yourself getting angry even at this person, the cashier, who's probably quite innocent in the whole thing. We have people who are angry because we have to wear masks. And then on the other side of that, we have people who are angry because other people don't want to wear masks. Oh, by the way, this thing happened this week called the U.S. election. <laughs> Did you notice there was some anger on both sides around that? We're going to actually come back and talk a little bit about the U.S. election a little bit later on. Not because it directly concerns us here in Canada in the same way that it does in the States, but because of what I see is a systemic problem that comes when it has to do with anger. So the question should become, can we be angry and not sin? I mean, there's this emotion that comes to us of anger. There's, there's things that can happen. 
things that can impact our lives, and, and anger can come. Can we be angry and not sin? Matthew chapter 5, it was just read for us. Uh, let's go back and have a look at this. Matthew chapter 5, you have your Bibles? You want to open up? Matthew chapter 5, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. And we read this starting at verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say this, that everyone who is angry with his brother will also be liable to judgment. Everyone who is angry is liable to judgment. So can you be angry and not sin? You look at this and you think, no. Apparently, if you're angry, you are sinning. Remember, you have to take what you read in the Bible, in the context of the Bible. And so there are other portions of Scripture that deal with this too. And we're going to look at, at a couple of those real quickly. And I'm not going to get you to turn there, but in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Did you, did you hear how Paul separated that out? He said, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, Paul's saying you can be angry without sinning. Well, how do we reconcile that with what Jesus just said, that if you're angry with your brother, you're subject to judgment? Looks like it's a sin. How do we reconcile this? By the way, in Ephesians chapter 4, it goes on. Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And he also says, don't give the devil a foothold. So Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you've heard it said that you're not to murder. Okay, can we all agree on that? Can we just, can everyone here in Sunday Ray Baptist Church today, can we all agree that we shouldn't murder each other? All right, <laughs> thank you for agreeing with that, because if somebody said no, uh, that would have been really awkward for the rest of the sermon. He says, okay, so do not murder. You've heard it said, don't murder. And you all agree with that. And he says, but I'm going to tell you, if you are angry with your brother or with your sister, if you're angry with them, you're liable to the same judgment as the murderer. This reading that we're in, in Matthew chapter 5, this is, as I said, from the Sermon on the Mount. And the context of this is that Jesus is actually confronting many things that the Jewish leadership, the, the Pharisees and others had set up. They had set up all these boundaries around the original laws. And so you go back in the Old Testament, you look at the original laws. There, there were laws that were set up, but then they would set up all these boundaries and, and they would say, well, okay, you can do this, but you can't do that. And you can do this, but you can't do that. And they, they started naming specific things that you could do. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus continually says, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said. He, he says this over and over, and he talks, about, he talks about lust in this, he talks about divorce in this, he talks about all kinds of different things. You've heard it said. In other words, you have been brought up to believe that doing this is wrong, but Jesus, in each case, takes it a little bit further. He, he, he just kind of pushes the envelope a little further. He says, so while murder is wrong, Storing up anger in your heart is also wrong. So you agree with me that murder is wrong, but I want you to see that stirring up this anger and this bitterness in your heart, this is also wrong. See, according to your laws right now, you may not murder someone, but you could be the most angry, bitter person in the world, but you're not sinning. And so Jesus says, I'm going to take it a little bit further. I'm going to push this. It's not just about murder. This is about an issue of the heart. He's going from the boundaries of what you can and cannot do. He's saying you need to get your heart straight with God. By the way, when it comes to this question of can you be angry and not sin, we also have to remember that a little bit later in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, we're going to read this very famous story, very controversial story about Jesus when he goes into the temple, and you all know what I'm going to say, what does he do? He turns over what? 
the tables. Now, we've got some empty tables here. I would love, as part of a visual demonstration, just to come and start flipping these tables over. And, and you know, this is what we, we had this famous story. Jesus walks into the temple. He sees some things going on, and he turns over the tables, and we say, see, there Jesus got angry. And not only did he get angry, he took it out. He flipped tables over. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus did exactly that. And yet, you and I both would stand here today and believe that Jesus did not sin. Correct? Therefore, I believe it is possible to be angry and not sin. So how do we deal with this? Well, we're going to just talk a little bit about the Matthew chapter 21 passage, and then we're going to come back to Matthew chapter 5. In the Matthew chapter 21 passage, there's a few things I want you to understand about when Jesus goes in and he flips the tables over. The first thing is his anger didn't lead him to sin. He turned tables over, not people. Do you see the difference? He wasn't angry at the tables. He was angry with the people and what they were doing to the house of God, and and more specifically, what they were doing to the people who wanted to come and worship in that place. I won't go into all of the historical details of this, but what was essentially happening is that the church was stealing from the average person who wanted to come in and worship God. In fact, they were stealing to the point where it made it impossible for masses of people to follow the law and worship God in the way that they knew. Jesus was angry at this. He was angry at the people doing this, but Jesus did not come in and turn the people over. He turned the very tables over that were being used to hold people back from being able to worship. In his anger, it didn't lead him to sin. It led him to make a change in the system. Second thing I want you to note about when when Jesus turned the tables over is that Jesus' concern was with the heart of God. His concern was with the righteousness of God. His concern was that there are people wanting to come and worship who are being held back by the very people who should be enabling them to worship. There was a, a righteous anger Now, a righteous anger is something that comes when when you realize that what lines up with the heart of God is not what is happening. What lines up with the heart of God is not what is happening. And so you realize that God has a standard of righteousness, and what is happening falls short of that. Therefore, there's this righteous anger that comes into play. It is about what is right versus what is wrong. Jesus was concerned with the heart of God. Now, I said we were going to come back and talk about the U.S. election a little bit. We're going to actually insert that right in here for just a moment. Here's the problem, though, when humans want to justify their anger and say it's righteous anger. U.S. election, you've got two very opposing sides. If you don't know what I'm referring to, I think you should watch the news for five minutes today. And you will understand what I mean by two very opposing sides, Republican versus Democrat. Here's where this gets really messy. There are Christians, people who follow Jesus Christ, who are Democrats. And there are Christians, people who follow Jesus Christ, who are Republicans. Two opposite sides. And what bothers me most is that Christ's followers get mad at other people, including other Christ followers, for their political standing in this, whether Republican or whether Democrat, when they can both stand there and say, we are making the righteous decision by who we follow. One group says, we are standing up for babies, we are standing up against abortion, we're going to stand over here. Another group says, we are standing up against the man who's tearing apart the world, who's, who's saying things that we don't agree with, we're standing on righteousness over here. Both sides standing on righteousness, both sides getting angry at the other. We are fallen people. And when we want to start arguing on what we believe is righteous or not is is not righteous, we had better have a very firm foundation. And we had also better remember 
that when Jesus turned over the tables, after he left that day, he was not remembered for his anger. You ask anybody, a Christ follower or not, say, give me the top five characteristics of Jesus. And there isn't a person alive that I know of who is going to say, characteristic number one, Jesus was angry. He's always angry. He was always walking in temples and flipping over tables. That's not the primary characteristic of Jesus. That's not what characterizes his life. He did it one time. He knew what was righteous. And by the way, in Matthew chapter 21, when that happens, here's the part that we miss about when Jesus flipped the tables over. The very next verse says this, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and were healed. You see, what Jesus was doing was making a way for the hurting, the vulnerable, the poor, the weak to come to him that they could be forgiven, they could be healed. That's what characterizes Jesus' life. Love, grace, mercy, power. Not anger. And yet so many people You watch the news, you spend five minutes on Facebook, and you'll realize that so many people get so caught up on standing on one side or on the other side that when they do that, they get angry at the others, forgetting that this isn't what is supposed to characterize our life. In fact, I follow a man named Timothy Keller on Facebook some, and Tim Keller has actually been standing to say, we need to stop fighting against each other, and we need to be united in this, regardless of what your belief is on either side. And so now he's got the people who are on the left side of him, not only angry at the people on the right, they're angry at him. And he's got the people on the right side, not only angry at the left, they're now angry at him too. And what it means is, no matter what stance you want to take, someone is going to be angry with you. And you know what? As I preach this message, I think there's people who are watching, maybe even here right now in this place, who are angry with me. Because I didn't take a stand on one side or the other here just now. I didn't say which is right, which is wrong, or vice versa. And there are some who want to look and say, just say it, just say which one. I think what's much more important as Christ followers is that our lives be characterized by love and grace and mercy and the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Not characterized by anger. Man, in the year 2020, everyone is angry about something. Everyone is angry about something. And I believe that you can be angry and not sin. I believe that Paul said, be angry but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on that anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. See, this is part of the problem with all of our emotions that we experience, is that when we, when we allow those emotions to, to linger and hold, what we do is we, we've cracked the door open and the devil loves to just put his foot in the door. Have you ever had a door that's open, somebody's put a foot in, and you can't move the door? Have you ever had that experience? You you can't close the door with someone's foot there. You can push hard. It doesn't hurt them. It doesn't bother them. Their foot just stays in the door. And, And Paul says, don't give the devil a foothold by being angry. It's okay to be angry, but don't let him have that foothold into your heart. And what is what Jesus is talking about? Back in Matthew chapter 5, he's talking about your heart. And ultimately... What Paul is saying and what Jesus is saying are the same thing. Do not allow your anger to give Satan a foothold into your life where you can't close that door anymore. You know, maybe there's people here who said, no, I used to be able to get angry, I could deal with it, and that would go away. But now, when I get angry, I just stay angry. I stay angry for, for hours and sometimes days. And sometimes weeks. And let's be honest, there are people we know who have been angry for months and months and years. One of the things that bothers me most is when I'm talking with somebody who's not a Christ follower and they tell me, you know what? The church is filled with angry people. 
Really? Is that what we give off? And maybe it's because of a sermon like this where I'm quite passionate about it. Maybe people are sitting there going, boy, he was, he was angry this morning. Not angry, passionate. We can't allow anger to get in and allow the devil the foothold. So Matthew chapter 5. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, he says, if you're going to make an offering, if you're going to make an offering and you remember as you go to make that offering that, you know what, my brother's got something against me. You want to know why the church in North America is falling? We aren't taking the Word of God seriously. The Word of God says if you have a problem with your brother, and you know your brother's got a problem with you, go to them. Talk it out. Work it out. Understand that there are bigger things at play than than just your own agreement on a certain issue. You've heard it said. But I tell you that anyone who is angry will be liable to judgment. Jesus here is taking it from those boundaries that we talked about, those, those list of things that you could and could not do. I can do all of these. I can't do all of these. I'll just follow those lists. But my heart can be falling apart. Jesus is saying, I'm trying to get to your heart. How many of you have been living with angry hearts and bitter hearts? And as Paul would say later on in Ephesians, you've allowed the devil the foothold to hold that door open. You've opened it and you left it open long enough that now Satan's got his foot in there and he's not allowing you to close that door and there's just angry bitterness that is built up within you. What do we do about it? Well, Jesus says, go and talk to your brother. If you want more instruction on how to do that, go to Matthew chapter 18. Go talk to the person who has something wrong with you or you have something wrong with them, you're angry with, they're angry with you. Go and talk to them. There are all kinds of of suggestions that you can have on how to talk to somebody who's angry with you or you're angry with them. Look them up. Go and talk to them. Bring another person if you need to, but but talk to them in a manner which you understand that sitting at the table with you is Jesus. Every conversation you have when when you go to talk to somebody, every conversation you ever have, but when you go to talk to somebody who you're angry with or they're angry with you, you picture Jesus Christ himself sitting at the table with you. And then you say, every word that comes out of my mouth is going to reflect the The fact that the Lord of the universe is sitting in our midst. And then you have the conversation. You talk with them. There's something else, though, that I think is really important for us to understand. When it comes to dealing with anger, I'm not asking you to deal with anger the same way that the rest of the world deals with anger. There's a ton of self-help books. You can go read all the self-help books you want. They're going to try and steer you in certain directions, and some of them are good ideas, and some of them are maybe not so great ideas. But I'm not going to ask you to deal with your anger in the same way I would ask somebody in the world who does not know Jesus to deal with their anger. I want you to understand, as a Christ follower... You have the power, let me just change that wording just a little bit. You have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. And there may be some people who are here this morning or who are listening online, and you're saying, but I've got so much anger inside me, I don't know what to do with it. If you are a Christ follower, the very first thing that you must do is you must begin to say, 
Lord, I need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to come inside of me because I've allowed Satan to have a foothold in my heart and I can't have that anymore. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Spirit, to come into my life. I know you're already there and I need a supernatural work within me. Do I think it is possible to be angry and not sin? I do, and here is the primary reason why. Because as Christ followers, we have this spirit living within us. By the way, the fruit of the spirit, which I mention quite often here, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and anger. (laughs) There was no reaction to that. Maybe you're all grinning underneath those masks. I don't know, but there was no reaction to that. Um, I was hoping that maybe somebody might go, uh, you got that wrong. Anger is not part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, faithfulness, and self-control. Nowhere will you find that when the Holy Spirit of God comes in you, you will become more angry. What you will find is that when you allow yourself to follow the teachings of Jesus, you get into his word, you get into the way he taught, the way he led, the way he interacted with people, you'll find love and peace and mercy and grace. By the way, I want to make one more note about anger before we close this off. I find that I myself get angry over things that happen against me. In other words, somebody, look, almost every sermon, there could be someone who thinks it's the best sermon in the world and someone who thinks it's the worst sermon in the world. Rarely do you hear someone say that was the best sermon in the world, though. You sometimes do hear but what a terrible word that was. You said this thing. Do you understand what that means when you say this thing? And inside of me at that moment, there's this little bit that just wants to be angry in that moment because someone has accused me. Someone's come against me in some way. Or you go back to that that lineup at the grocery store. You go back to the, the person cutting you off in traffic. And it's offenses against you, and you become very self-righteous, and you get angry. I dare you to go through the Gospels and find the times that people found fault with, disagreed with, argued with, betrayed Jesus, and find me one time when they came to him with all of those things. Find me one time when he got angry in those. That's not what made Jesus angry. Jesus knew where he stood with God. He knew that he was the Son of God. God himself. He he knew this. And any accusation that someone could bring, any fault that someone could accuse him of, any betrayal, and he didn't get angry as a result. His anger stemmed from when people took what God made right and they flipped it upside down and made it wrong. How much more angry should I be? Think about this. How much more angry should I be over the atrocities that are happening to men and women and children across the world today? How much more angry should I be about those things than if somebody cuts me off on my way to Costco later on? In our world today, there are millions of people who have been intentionally displaced from their homes because of conflict, because of war. There are millions of children who have been removed from their families. Why? Because someone wants to take them and sell them, either for sex or slavery or both. How much more angry should those things make me than whether or not Donald Trump or Joe Biden became president? And whether or not I have to stand in line for 35 seconds longer than normal at the store? 
You see, that's righteous anger. That's, that's something that the will of God is here and we have missed the mark completely on it. That's something that we can become angry about. And then we can flip some tables along the way, not hurt people, but systems that are set up to make these things happen. All so that the hurt and the lonely and the poor might come to Jesus for healing. But how many people come to Jesus for healing because I am cursing under my breath about the weight at the store? I don't know what your experience is, but so far for me, it's a grand total of zero. I feel like we could talk on this subject all day and just scratch the surface. But I believe that as Christ followers, we need to seek forgiveness. We need to seek reconciliation. We need to seek peace. When you look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, this is what he's asking people to do. When you have this anger, seek forgiveness. Seek reconciliation. Seek peace. Because carrying around that anger and bitterness does nobody any good. It doesn't bring him glory. It doesn't bring me glory. It doesn't help the hurting. It hurts me. It hurts others. And it hurts my testimony about the God that I love and serve. Are you dealing with anger today? It's okay to be angry. It's okay to have that emotion. It's not okay to give the devil a foothold. It's not okay to allow that to begin to change your heart. It's not okay to make that, to take that anger and bring it into vocalization and actions which hurt other people. There is a better way. That is the way of love. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We recognize, God, that we live in a world where there is much struggle, much conflict, much anger. But Lord, We're not here to point fingers other than pointing right back at ourselves and say, God, I deal with anger. I deal with bitterness. And sometimes, Lord, I give it a root in my life. So, Father, today, help us to rely on the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to seek forgiveness and reconciliation and peace. Lord, help us as Christ followers to love each other and to love the people around us in this world, to show your love and grace and mercy. Not to be afraid of your righteousness. Not to be afraid to show your righteousness. Lord, that first we are known by the person we follow we follow God himself and God is love may that be how we are known we pray this in Jesus name amen please stand with us as we close in worship together This 
is what I'm glad to do. It's time to live a life of love that pleases you. And I will give my all to you. Surrender everything I have to follow you. I'll follow. That's our desire, is to follow you. Lord, there's sometimes when other things come along, we want to follow in a different path. We want to follow ways of anger and bitterness. And, because it seems right, it seems like it'll make us feel good for a while if we can just lash out. God, we don't want to follow those things. We want to follow you. I want to lay everything else down, God, and just follow you today and follow you in every day leading forward. But that our lives might portray your glory to a world that needs to see the glorious Son of God. We thank you for your righteousness and for your love. We thank you that you loved us enough that you came. Jesus Christ came to this earth and died for us. Not lashing out to us in anger, but laying down his life that we might know life, that we might know a right relationship with God, that we might know a better way of love. We pray this in Jesus' name.